Hello, uh, welcome to our presentation, uh, Digitizing Community Collections at Texas Tech University Libraries. My name is Matthew McInerney, and I'm an associate librarian here at Texas Tech and the director of the Digital Scholarship Lab. I'm here with my colleague. Hi, my name is Megan Scott. Um, I'm an assistant librarian for digital curation at Texas Tech, and I've been working on these projects with Matt this year. So, the task. In 2021, we were tasked with finding collections outside of our usual project partners, like our Southwest Collection and Special Collections Library, to broaden the services uh, of our, that our Digital Scholarship Lab could provide. Uh, we usually get these uh, references from our subject liaisons, which we meet with once a year to discuss what we're, we are looking for from departments and research centers and research institutes. Um, those subject liaisons have been instrumental in referring colleges, departments, and other entities to us for digitization projects. We've also sent out emails to research centers and institutes, uh, letting them know what kinds of services we can offer. Um, and sometimes, uh, but rarely, departments find us on their own or are referred to us by other departments that we've helped previously. Since 2021, we have established relationships with the Museum of Texas Tech, uh, both the Paleontology and the Clothing and Textiles Division. Paleontology gave us a glaciology research collection and the Clothing and Textiles is their research lab library. Uh, the National Wind Institute uh, allowed us to digitize their research library and index it. Human Sciences, uh, we have a, a bevy of cookbooks uh, from them. Agriculture Education, they have a newsletter that we have digitized. And then our community collection from Lubbock uh, First Baptist Church, which is historical documents. These collections all need a level of digitization, copyright creation, metadata description, and indexing. Uh, we don't take permanent custody of these items. We get them back along with a digital copy based on the requirements, either hard drive, cloud, et cetera. To date, we have scanned and digitized and uploaded about 2,133 total volumes uh, or records. Uh, and 564 of those have been in public domain. Uh, because of uh, our great curation uh, that Megan has done, uh, those 564 have been put online in full text. And right now she's going to talk a little bit more about that process. Thanks, Matt. Uh, yes, so we use curation to refer to the process of determining the copyright status of each of the items in these collections that we receive. So anything determined to be in the public domain or that we might receive special permission for um, is made available online in our digital collections. And then depending on the collection, the copyrighted items uh, might receive a metadata only records that just provide basic information about the item and who to contact for research inquiries or requests. But as you can imagine, um, this can become a very time consuming process. So um, some of the tools that we use for determining this copyright status are just a general knowledge of um, what is considered um, public domain in the United States. So as of 2024, anything published before 1928, as well as anything published between 1929 and 1963, but without um, a copyright renewal are considered public domain, as well as anything published by the US government as part of um, and employees' official duties are also considered public domain. Another great tool um, is the Stanford Copyright Renewal Database. This is really useful for checking the copyright renewal status of those items that fall into that in-between um, kind of period between 1929 and 1963. If the copyright renewal wasn't filed, then those would fall into the public domain and we would be able to put them um, up online. As well as Hathi Trust, um, we use Hathi Trust to check if any of the items considered public domain might already be available elsewhere online, um, which is really great for saving us time and resources if people are already able to access um, the volume somewhere else. And then when in doubt, um, the best course of action is always just to reach out to the publisher. This can also be really time consuming, um, especially with government entities. It may take a while before you get a response. Um, but it can also be really rewarding and valuable. Um, for In the case of the Human Sciences Collection, um, many of the cookbooks that we have um, were published by community organizations like women's leagues uh, or churches, other things like that. And once we contacted them, they were really enthusiastic to give their permission for us to include their cookbooks 
in our digital collections. And in this case, um, a write statement would just be included in the metadata uh, stating that we received permission from the, from the owners of the copyright to include the record in our collection for education and research purposes only. So the next slide here um, is just an example. We use Microsoft Planner for project management um, and each collection receives its own Excel spreadsheet for this copyright curation process. Um, this is really great to refer to once the scanning portion of the project is complete and we're able to begin uploading those items that are determined to be public domain. The image here is an example of the curation spreadsheet uh, for the paleontology collection. So it includes things like the title of the item, uh, the date of the publication, publisher name, copyright status, some relevant links for cataloging, um, and then any notes. Items marked in yellow here um, are maybes for copyright and are ones that might require further research um, and I will likely contact the publishers about. And then items highlighted in red are things that we do not scan um, because they're either duplicate copies or volumes that are already available elsewhere digitally. So now I'll hand it back to Matt um, to talk about some of the lessons that we've learned throughout this process and some of the future goals for our digital collections. Thanks, Megan. So we have learned quite a few lessons during these past few years of these uh, community collections. Uh, the first of which is that a memorandum of understanding is a vital uh, thing to have for a project um, and any specifications that are unique with that entity that you're working with um, that might be out of the ordinary. We generally write up an MOU before we proceed with any project. It allows us to get in writing the project outline and expectations. This also includes the deliverables such as what DPI will scan it in, the formats, TIFF, PNG, JPEG, PDF, and any metadata description we create for the records and where we'll be uploading the collection, which is typically our DSpace. The MOU also puts in writing any requests that the collection manager may have indicated during the initial project discussions, which in the past this has been for records that might not want to be returned to the place of origin through either disposal or donation. Another request we've had is to investigate how to index a collection in another manner, such as using WorldCat's digital collection import. Creation, as I have indicated and uh, Megan has talked about, can be incredibly tedious, but it is necessary because we don't want to be spending a lot of time taking records down. Uh, we also don't want to be in any legal trouble for putting records up that shouldn't be made available. And finally, timelines are fluid. Some of our collections we thought we could get done in a year due to delivery timelines of the items, it's been extended to three years. Sometimes the materials just take longer or the lab must shift to other collections as priorities occur for our archive. Unless you're able to get the collection all at once and you have very specific guidelines and the staff, we found that it's best to overestimate the time that you think you'll take. You might have the results of a time study for every scanner and process in your lab and have a theoretical time calculator for any given collection, but you will run into the delays, the uh, staff being gone, materials having to be rescanned, processing taking longer, technical difficulties, and other issues. So we are looking towards the future and trying to uh, make things more efficient and even better. Uh, as we build upon what we've learned. So some, some things we are working on to better advocate for the Digital Scholarship Lab are first, we would like to develop a better landing page for our digital collections to show off what we've worked on and what services we can offer. In the past few years, many departments we've worked with have told us that they had no idea that we either existed or could perform the digitizing services for them. So we'd like to change that by increasing how we market ourselves to the TTU and Lubbock communities. We'd like to advertise a service for digital collection consultations, since we do consider ourselves experts on digital projects. And if a consultation results in a viable project, we have favorable terms for it. If 80% or more of the total collection can be placed online in our repository, we'd offer a free service for digitization, processing, metadata description, and uploading. We want to enrich the resources we have in our repository, especially if it's a community entity that isn't available currently to the public. And finally, 
Thanks to the curation service that Megan has done, we've identified a lot of public domain records, but there are still numerous copyrighted materials that we digitize for archival copies to eventually put online when their time comes. But before that occurs, we'd like to create a virtual reading room that allows patrons to access copyrighted materials in a secure, remote environment. And that's it for us. Thank you so much for listening.